Hey, good morning. Sorry, I, I missed the recording start time. But yeah, I'll read a brief statement about the dana. <clears throat> In Buddhism, when practitioners share their understanding of the teachings and practice, it is offered freely as a practice of dana paramita. Dana is a Pali word that means generosity or to give freely. And this practice is done without expectation of getting something in return. This is the spirit of speaking about the Dharma. Other ways to practice Dana are to offer support to those who share the teachings, to support places of spiritual practice, and to give without judgment or expectation when opportunities arise. Those who share the teachings at Great Tree do so on a Dana basis. Please support their practice by giving what you can. And um, Daigu, uh, what's the best way for you for us to send um, Dana to you? Uh, just keep, keep, it, keep it at Great Tree, Trey. Keep it at Great Tree. Okay, thank you. And now our great friend, Randall Daigu Pride, is going to give us a speech. He. Uh, He's a graphic designer and a poet living in Arden, North Carolina. In 1998, he received the precepts from Reverend Tejo Munich in Zen Center of Asheville's Jukai ceremony. In 2015, he received a lay teacher's okesa from Reverend Tejo Munich at Great Tree Zen Temple's Zakai Tukodu ceremony. He co-facilitates at the Zen Center of Asheville for Zazen instruction and Buddhist studies and did the same for 10 years at Craggy Correctional Center in Woodfin, North Carolina. He has five wonderful children and nine incredible grandchildren <clears throat> in Austin, Texas, Madison, Wisconsin, and Vancouver, Canada. Welcome, Daigu. Thank you. Uh, yeah, the title was kind of uh, off the cuff. Uh, Tejo asked me for a title and scratched my head and out came in the middle of the muddle. And then I realized I had to come up with something. <laughs> so uh, going to Webster's muddle is the state of being confused. And in context of this talk, a metaphor for samsara, loosely translated, as cyclic, aimless wandering, or more precisely, as world. Our world, being Earth, whose ground we walk on is dirt, which when rained upon becomes mud, which when splattered upon our windshield by a passing truck makes it difficult to see where we are going. Middle, as you might have guessed, refers to one of Buddhism's primary signifiers, the middle way. First, elucidated in Shakyamuni's first sermon on the Four Noble Truths Eightfold Path, the middle path, between the extremes of sensual indulgence and self-mortification, both of which he famously experienced in his life as first a prince and then as an ascetic. He situated this path itself between the middle of the second noble truth's two causal forks of suffering, attachment to what we prefer and aversion to what we reject, which we cycle through continuously. These eight functions of right or correct, understanding, concentration, mindfulness, effort, thought, speech, action, and livelihood are the fundamental tools on our travel kit through samsara, or the eight spokes of our vehicle's first dharma wheel. Soon after, Buddha used the middle way metaphor again with his teaching on the 12 links of dependent origination, the causes and conditions of phenomenal existence. In the Kachanagata Sutra of avoiding the extreme concepts of existence or eternalism and non-existence or nihilism, or in terms of a sentient being that there is something unchanging in a self 
is called eternalism, that there is no link between itself through time is called annihilism. In the second century CE, Nargarjuna in his Mula Majama Karika or verses of the middle way, the foundational text of the Majamaka school of Mahayana Buddhism refers to the 15th chapter of the Kachana Sutra, which focuses on deconstructing those extreme concepts and to show how they are incompatible with the causality engine of dependent origination. As Nargajuna concisely sums up, whatever is dependently co-arisen, that is explained to be emptiness. That being a dependent designation is itself the middle way. Something that is not dependently arisen, such a thing does not exist. Therefore, a non-empty thing does not exist. I'll repeat that. Whatever is dependently co-arisen, that is explained to be emptiness. That being a dependent designation is itself the middle way. Something that is not dependently arisen, such a thing does not exist. Therefore, a non-empty thing does not exist. Out of this formulation, Narajuna introduces one of the other significant pairings in Buddhism, that of the two truths, conventional and ultimate. These are not extremes of polarities like indulgence versus self-mortification or conceptual dualities like eternalism versus nihilism, but instead two interrelated ways of understanding reality or two sides of one ontological coin, if you will. The Heart Sutra's form is emptiness, emptiness form, is presenting this same teaching under the Jesus of Bodhisattva Avalokitesvara. The Buddha Dharma's most extensive exploration of the middle way metaphor is, of course, the Avatamsaka Sutra, which emerged in stages beginning in the second century CE and continuing uh, <clears throat> until it reached China, probably in the seventh or eighth century, I'm not sure, and has been appropriately called the Bodhisattva Pitaka, uh, Pitaka being basket of teaching as it includes such topics as the bodhisattva path and the equality of things and emptiness. Among its most notable declarations is the description of the cosmos as infinite realms upon realms mutually containing one another, eloquently, eloquently expressed in the elaborate metaphor of Indra's net where at each node of the intersecting cords sits a clear jewel reflecting all the other jewels ad infinitum. This vision had a huge influence upon the emerging Buddhist schools in China, such as Yuan Yan and Chan. Chang Chun Yuan in his book, Original Teachings of Chan Buddhism, describes it in this matter, in this manner. Excuse me, drying out. It is the unimpeded mutual solution of all particularities, where each particularity, besides being itself, penetrates all other particularities and is in turn penetrated by them. This harmonious interplay between particularities and also between each particularity and universality creates a luminous universe free from spatial and temporal limitations and yet no less the world of daily affairs. This is called Dharma Dachu. In it, the boundaries of each particularity melt away and the reality of each becomes infinitely interfused with every other being. These are descriptions of reality 
from the perspective of a Buddha, an awakened one, and will not be showing up in our telescopes and microscopes, though perhaps physics, quantum entanglement, or multiverse theories are approaching some hint of it. But since Darwin's breakthrough understanding of the natural selection mechanism of evolution has yet to budge the beliefs of much of humanity, especially on the nature of cause and effect, we can still benefit from this all-inclusive vision of reality to guide us in these times of self-other discord and environmental degradation. We do not need an advanced degree in mathematics or biology to practice the middle way's various functions and experientially become acquainted with the equanimity, compassion, and insight into samsara's muddying machinations. As Buddha has said, it is a path for the sharp and dull-witted among us, i.e. an universal path. Chan and Zen have other notable texts poetically explicating these truths, such as the 8th century's Sandokai, or merging of difference in unity, by Shitao Siquan, which is chanted in Zen monasteries to this day. The Ninth Century's Five Ranks by Dongshang Lingue, one of the founders of our Soto set. And the 13th century poem, Genjo Koan, by our Japanese Soto Zen's Ehe Dogen. Its ninth verse in Shohaku Okamura's translation reads When a person attains realization, it is like the moon reflection on the wa in water. The moon never becomes wet. The water is never disturbed. Although the moon is vast, a vast and great light, it is reflected in a drop of water. The whole moon and even the whole sky are reflected in a drop of dew and a blade of grass. Realization does not destroy the person as the moon does not make a hole in the water. The person does not obstruct realization as a drop of dew does not obstruct the moon in the sky. The depth is the same as the height. To investigate the significance of the length and brevity of time, we should consider whether the water is great or small and understand the size of the moon and the sky. There are 86,400 seconds in a day. In each second, science informs us, 37,000 billion billion chemical reactions take place within our body cells, while 5 million of those cells are replaced by new ones. Our brain's neurons fire off a total of 20 million messages in that second, and our hearts beat once an electrical signal synchronization of millions of cardiac muscle cells. And for the most part, we do not interfere. So that is my presentation this morning, short, concise. Uh, <clears throat> I'll be glad to have it open up to discussion if y'all want to talk about it or something else, you know, it's rather short. Um, sure, Lorna. I also love the, uh, the middle of the muddle. Um, muddle also has another phrase that I've been becoming aware of. Um, it's in teaching, I mean, in, in cooking, where you put ingredients together and you use a stick to muddle them. You don't really grind them or anything. You just kind of smush them up together and uh, then say like lemon and mint. And then you'd say put uh, sparkling water or something in it and it makes a drink. It makes something very special when you just kind of smush things together. And uh, I was thinking that we're a bit of a muddle in the middle, in the middle way. We're getting squished by um, life by uh, things we learn along the path. And uh, so it's kind of like we're all in the middle of this muddle 
going down the middle way and uh, bringing out our essence, I guess you might say, by just kind of muddling us. <laughs> I like that. I, I just, my mind was going crazy with the title. I just love it. <laughs> I, I think that's very appropriate uh, for this. Yes. Uh, with that whole uh, scenario of everything uh, within each other. Yes. So there's just like Buddhism, all these pairings. Here we go. Here's another pairing for muddle. Very good. Thank you. Sure, Lisa. I um the the muddle in the middle. I um or the middle of the muddle. Um, I I relate to that kind of the um. I feel, I feel like that's where I am right now. Of like you have that that excitement and and that new curiosity about things and and um and so that excitement kind of carries you you know to to move forward and then and then eventually that kind of subsides and and then you're and then you're left to do the work that's that's kind of how i i'm feeling it of um when i learned the term samsara it was like oh my god yes like that just fit like you know in in the muddle of my brain and and that kind of thing and um so so it, it was it was good to hear kind of like reinvigorating that okay you're you're in you're in the middle you're you're still you know you got to do the work and and um and continue continue on um you know, b beyond the the splash of excitement and ha, ah. um, so that's kind of what how I'm relating to it. Of yeah, this is you're still doing the work. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what this uh, the last part of that uh, ninth verse. Dogen says to investigate the significance of the length and brevity of time, we should consider whether the water is great or small and understand the size of the moon sky is like we keep cycling back. You know, we'll, we'll get these insights and then, you know, all of a sudden it, it's muddly again and we have to dig some more. Uh, so it's uh, coppers and coppers of digging. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, it, it gives encouragement. It gives encouragement to to when you feel like you're stuck in the quagmire. Yeah, it does. That's why we return to these texts over and over again to uh, rekindle that excitement. You're, you're right. And Thank I love that, that, that uh, since I'm a poet, I, I'm really uh, appreciate the the poetic uh, expressions of all these in folks, you know, that uh, this is a very difficult uh, thing to understand and, and the, the and all these metaphors and plays with language uh, help break through our usual linear way of thinking and looking at the world. And, uh, you know, you, you read them again a year from now and they're fresh because of that, uh, the poetry and the they're not dead, They're very live texts. Yeah, thank you. Sure, thank you. Um, the word, the word muddle for me, like, um, I mean, the image that always, that immediately comes to mind is just like mud just like trudging, trudging through the mud. Um, and that's, I just relate to that a lot. That's just kind of how, like, I feel like I kind of just move through the day and life is just like, you know, just, 
dealing with all these muddy thoughts, muddy feelings, you know, muddy, muddy actions and just, um, yeah, I just feel very much in, in the middle of it, <laughs> like, like the title. Um, and so I, I just really appreciate the, that recognition, just like, this is it, you know, just going, going through the mud and, and it's okay. And, um, yeah. And then when the, when the mud in, in this context, I think of like the lotus flower and how it blooms out of the mud. Um, and, um, uh, yeah, just, I appreciate, I appreciate your talk and, and your, uh, wisdom and, and bringing in the poetry and the text and, um, yeah, I was uh, like trying to like wrap my head around uh, the science bit you added at the end of just like, I would think it was like the 86,400 seconds and then all the billions upon billions of chemical reactions and all the, all of that. It was just like, my head was like spinning. And um, it's like, to me, like could be like a koan, just like sitting with that, for my brain, that unfathomable um, information. <laughs> so yeah thank you sure. yeah it's uh, uh darwin is one of my great heroes and that uh here was a, here was a guy that came from <clears throat> you know this uh certain belief system he was christian and he was actually uh, uh trained to be uh, a, a country priest you know, and uh, he was wealthy. He had his land and everything. He didn't have to work. You know, it's one of those kind of things in England at that time. But he uh, he had this uh, sort of drive to really observe nature without. Uh, uh, without the conditioning he was brought up with. He, for some reason, broke through that and was able to look directly at what was in front of him without overlaying it with ideas that he was brought up with, which was quite remarkable. Uh, so, <clears throat> uh, and then he came up with, even though the sort of the idea of evolution had been swir swirling around for, for many years, He's the one that cracked through with understanding how it worked with natural selection, which is all about cause and effect. And of course, he was very reluctant to share that with the world. He sat on that for a long time. And uh, finally, when uh, uh, this other guy whose name I'm forgetting right now, I shouldn't, but I, I am forgetting his name. Uh, came up with a similar idea. And so uh, Darwin decided, well, okay, I got to publish this, I guess. And so they kind of did it together, but, but Darwin had a little bit deeper of an understanding of it. And of course, it uh, got all kinds of criticism, of course, but uh, even to this day, uh, millions of people in the world cannot accept that uh, view of reality because it is so contrary to what we normally experience, you know, just going through our day. And, uh, and it's the same with Buddhism, you know, it's been 2,500 years or so, and, and people are still having uh, trouble wrapping their, uh, their minds around this. Uh, and in spite of the thousands and thousands of texts we now have, uh, <clears throat> Uh, it's still uh, challenging for us. And what you said earlier in the opening sutra about the, how difficult it is to have this life and encounter the Dharma <coughs> uh, really uh, points to all that. And so we're, we're just really fortunate I mean, when I first started getting interested in, in Buddhism was back in the 60s, there was not a lot in, uh, in uh, our bookstores that uh, discussed it. There were only a few books. And now, look, they're everywhere. We, 
look at the library of great tree uh, we have all these wonderful books now on Buddhism from all different angles, from all different traditions. So uh, we're just totally blessed with all that. You should take advantage of it, continue on. And I really appreciate uh, Great Tree's strength and hanging in there through the pandemic and getting the, the audiovisual stuff going and, and, and staying connected with the, the wider Sangha. It's, uh, it's just a wonderful testament to uh, Tejo's vision. Sure. I, when we talk about like the technology and stuff that um, I, I still find it also very, um, I'm also very grateful of, I'm coming into uh, Buddhism and, and being part of this Sangha uh, by way of Zoom. I, I haven't experienced it any other way than sitting here in front of my laptop. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I, I, I too feel uh, very honored to, to be the recipient of, of technology and, um, and allowing me to start my path of sitting right here in my chair, <laughs> you know, of, uh, so yeah, it's, it's a powerful, powerful tool. It is, yes. I wish mine worked better. <laughs> I have to remember how to, uh, unfortunately my webcam, every time I turn the computer off, the computer forgets it's there and I have to re-go re through that whole setup process again to get it going. But once it's going, it works just fine. But, uh, yeah. And we love seeing you, Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Where do you live, Lisa? I'm in Blacksburg, Virginia. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I hope to visit some point. It, it'll be a, it'll be a great a great trip to to check out Great Tree and. Yes, yeah, come on down. Yeah, well, you're at least you're on the right coast. Yes. <laughs> True. Thank you. That kind of makes the image of Indra's net um, meaningful, too. I mean, the fact that each one of us is attached to this, each of us is a little sparkle on the Indra's net, and we're all connected, even when we're not in the same place, and we're all connected with all the other practitioners everywhere else along the net, there are other little sparkles and we're all connected. I like that. <laughs> I do too, yeah, that's good. Um, you said you were a poet. Is there any place we can find your poetry? Uh, not very much. I've only published a few. Uh, <clears throat> I have a book together, one uh, 
one book of my poems uh, based on my dreams that I have uh, sent a few out as PDFs to friends and family, but uh, <clears throat> I've yet to actually try to get it published, which I should do. Um, poetry for me uh, is, is in a sense, uh, I approach it more like journaling uh, and then writing. Writing helps me find out uh, what I didn't realize I knew by writing. And uh, I recommend it for everyone, even if you're, you know, not publishing. I mean, uh, journaling and letter writing and all that way back before all the modern technology and everything was, uh, you know, practiced by uh, a lot more people at the time. Uh, <clears throat> probably for those for those reasons, I'm not quite sure, but sort of with uh, modern technology, it, it, even though it has its great benefits, just like you said, uh, it's also had its uh, effects that people don't journal and, and write as much as they used to in the old days. So uh, there's you know, there's the poetry biz out there. If, if you're in your your career is a literary path uh, and you choose poetry, then uh, you you are compelled more to publish than if it's uh, something like I do, which is a little more private. Uh, not that I don't try to share them, but uh, anyway, you're. You're, you're spurning me to uh, get off my butt and try to uh, put something out there. So I'll, I'll try to do that. Thank you, Laura. <laughs> well, there's always the self-publishing way. Yes, that's, well, that's what this one book I have is. It's a self-published thing, right? Uh, I guess I need to make that available. <laughs> You know, uh, one of my favorite poets is Real Khan. You all are probably familiar with him. Uh, Zen hermit monk from Japan. And uh, he was uh, sort of an anomaly in that he uh, decided he did not want to uh, stay in the monastery. He didn't, you know, after he became a priest and everything, he did not want to run a monastery. Uh, in fact, he had been the eldest son of this Japanese village, and he was actually supposed to take over sort of running, you know, the being the administrator in that village or whatever it was called. I'm not quite sure that community. And so he gave that to his younger brother and went to the monastery. And when he got out of the monastery, he realized he didn't want to run a monastery either. He was really not that kind of guy, you know. And, and so he just decided to be sort of a wandering monk, but he ended up uh, going back to his home village and just caretaking some huts and uh, sometimes around a, a, a Buddhist shrine or something, take care of it and would beg. As, as you know, in Japan and Asia, the begging was accepted. It wasn't looked down upon as we do in uh, our country, but... Uh, he was uh, quite a favorite in the village and uh, played with the children and uh, stayed up night writing poetry and discussing poetry with uh, his adult friends in the village and having some sake. And uh, so he was also a masterful calligraphy. So he was always dashing off poems in his lovely calligraphy and giving it to his friends and stuff. And, Later in life, he befriended this uh, nun who was much younger than him, and uh, it, it, it appears they may have fallen in love, but both being monks, you know, they uh, kept their uh, respective positions in that sense. But uh, after he died, she went around and collected all of his poems from all these people and his friends and had them published. And if it wasn't for her, we wouldn't have his, wouldn't know him. It would have been sort of lost in history. And, you know, uh, 
those are very important poems uh, for not just poetry, but also for Buddhism and Zen. And so we're very fortunate to have those. So in, in some ways, I, uh, I relate very much to real Khan as far as that sort of sensibility. Uh, anyway, that's an aside, but I recommend his poems. And Shoaku Akamura uh, is also a big fan of Rokan and, and uh, has a lot of commentary, some of his points, as well as Dogen's. And as y'all know, probably in August, Shoaku is going to give three or four days of lectures on Dogen's points. So uh, I recommend everybody uh, go ahead and uh, can. Uh, sign up for that. I haven't signed up for it myself yet, but I'm going to. might know that the most popular po poet in the world is a Sufi Muslim. And you already have probably guessed now who I'm talking about, it's Rumi. A lot of people uh, don't know that uh, Rumi was a Sufi Muslim, but he was. And uh, I also relate strongly to Rumi. And Rilke, you got the three R's, Rumi, Rilke, and Real Khan. I think uh, somebody ought to put out a book kind of pairing, uh, I mean, combining all of those three, three poets together in one book. That would be an interesting uh, correlation there. Maybe I'll do that after I retire. Well, your name starts with an R. Ah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I I see the connection already. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Blind side of me there. <laughs> I'll put that on my bucket list. What was that third R? Rilke, uh, the German <laughs> Christian poet Rilke. Uh, yeah, I had a friend who was German, and she would read the poems to me in uh, German. And then we'd look at the English translation. She had a book that had the English and the German. So she'd read them in German and then we'd look at that was years ago. Cool. But, uh, yeah. yeah, really interesting stuff. That's that's a good way to do it. Yeah, to have the language, the original language. Because you when you translate, sometimes you lose some of the music and rhythm when you translate. It's hard to do that. So yes, that's a good, a good way to do it. Well, maybe that that's good for today. We can call this the call it quits here. Well, we thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. And, um, 
we usually end with the Thich Nhat Hanh, uh, closing sutra and it's an echo sutra so if I say it out loud will you echo me Randall sure okay may the merit of this practice may the merit of this practice benefit all beings benefit all beings and bring peace and bring peace have a good day everyone and thank you thank you all.